Guys, BG in the house, Tuesday evening, when this is being recorded. Um, it's fight week, we've got the big fight, Joshua versus Carlos Takam this week. Going to be doing a lot of coverage on the channel in the lead up to that fight. Uh, welcome to any new subscribers, can see a few new subscribers continue to jump on board. Thank you for doing so. Um, we're going to do the podcast tomorrow, Wednesday night at half eight. New subscribers, we do a podcast every Wednesday at half eight. In that, we're going to look back to last week's boxing. We're going to talk a bit more about next week's boxing. And kind of in this video, because I was away this weekend and haven't really caught up with a lot of stuff, I'm kind of going to jump around quite a bit, talk about four or five different topics, maybe just spend a minute or two on each, not go into it in too much depth, but, but just a few thoughts I wanted to, to put down. Um, first and foremost, I'm not one of these boxing fans, and long-term subscribers will hopefully know this, I'm not one of these boxing fans who hates on pay-per-view and hates on Eddie Hearn, but i got to say, this, this card this weekend you know, feels like it's falling apart at the seams, really. Um, Anthony Joshua versus Kubrat Pulev cancelled late notice. Carlos Takam drafted it as his opponent. Eddie Hearn says that Carlos Takam was on reserve. I'm sure that's true, but you know, whilst Takam has been in training, he hasn't been in training thinking he's about to fight the number one heavyweight on the planet in Anthony Joshua. So... For me, that late notice element really does take something away from this fight, if I'm honest. You know, that could be a, a, a much better fight if Takam had had a, a full camp anticipating he would be fighting Joshua. Robert Hellenius versus Dillian White. Again, late notice. Late notice fight made. Yeah, I did an initial preview of this and I said if Hellenius was in shape, it could be a 50-50 fight. I'm worried that he's not going to be in shape. Hellenius is a, a very, very, very big man. Um... And if he's not in shape, you know, that could potentially be a huge negative for this fight. Lenroy Thomas versus David Allen. Really weird situation with this fight. I'm not sure if I can think of a fight where there's a similar situation where kind of everyone's agreeing there's a, a big risk that the fight may well be off. But I haven't actually seen any official statement. You know, Dave Allen's Twitter seems to imply there's a chance the fight might still be happening. Like, it's fight week. It's Tuesday. It's for the Commonwealth Heavyweight title. How do we know or not know if this fight is going ahead? It seems madness. You know, if it's not going ahead, when are we going to get a new opponent? Is it going to be Thursday, Friday? You know, is Dave Allen going to be TBA? Um, I appreciate people aren't buying the pay-per-view to see David Allen, but I do think it's a poor look, you know, that this fight's being cancelled potentially that late notice and that an opponent on a bill of this magnitude is going to be brought in, what, a day or two before? I uh, heard today that Frank Bullioni versus Callum Johnson is off. And um, Frank Bullioni will instead be fighting Craig Spider Richards. Um, you know, and, and for me, it's it's disappointing. Um, as I say, White Hellenius for me is potentially a 50-50 fight. that could become a 90-10 fight if Robert Hellenius turns up massively overweight. David Allen versus Lenroy Thomas. You know, people scoff at that being a pay-per-view bit fight. And I understand why. Um, but I was actually looking forward to it. Uh, I thought it was a 50-50 heavyweight contest, which I like to see. Uh, Frank Bullioni versus Callum Johnson. Again, I know most people weren't buying the pay-per-view to see this matchup. But nevertheless, I kind of viewed that as a 50-50 fight. That, you know, I thought we could even get an upset in. I was really looking forward to seeing that. So for me, you know, this, this fight was... Uh, this bill was a, a, you know, a card with several competitive matchups. And several matchups that I thought would... Um, you know, be of great interest to the trade element of the boxing community. You know, the people who like watching English title fights, British title fights, Commonwealth title fights in, in gritty 50-50 accent. But sadly, that's been eroded. I mean, we'll, we'll wait and see who David Allen steps in the ring with. But, you know, presumably it can't be as good an opponent as Lenroy Thomas um, if it's going to be at this late notice. I mean, Spider Richards, Craig Richards... Um, You'd have to say, you wonder if he's being chucked to the wolves here. The guy's a, a super middleweight. You know, I've, I've actually uh, met him in passing. I wouldn't say I've met him in anything more than passing him. But, you know, looking at the guy physically, he's not the kind of super middleweight you, you immediately think needs to jump up to light heavyweight. You know, he's a guy like a... He's not a guy like a Callum Smith or a George Groves. He looked to me like a... Um, he didn't look like the biggest super middleweight to me. And, you know, he's... I remember he was in a fight recently. I think he was may have been on the next gem bill. I'm just pulling it up now. Yeah, that's right. He fought for the Southern Area Super Middleweight belt against 
Alan Higgins at your call and he won on points and if I recall that was a highly controversial decision where a lot of people in the crowd that night thought you know Higgins was maybe the deserved winner so you know I don't know if he's being fed to the wolves he, he's 9-0 and he hasn't become the biggest name maybe he's not the biggest ticket seller he's only got three KOs so he's not the biggest puncher in the world and you know maybe Eddie Hearns had a look at him and thinks yeah, you know, there's not too much I can do with him, so I'm just going to throw him in. But, you know, stepping up to fight a guy like Frank Bullioni up at light heavyweight for the, the British title on less than a week's notice seems like a, a tough, tough, tough ask. And given the fact he's got, you know, only a 33% knockout ratio uh, going up a weight class, it's hard to even question whether he's got a, you know, a puncher's chance, especially given the fact that he hasn't had a training camp for this fight. So, yeah, that's... Uh, a very, very, very tough ass for Craig Richards. But he, you know, I guess every uh, cloud has a silver lining. And Frank Bullioni isn't an unbeatable fighter. And if, if Craig Richards were to pull off the uh, unbelievable and, and get the win, then suddenly his name's going to be the British champion. And he's going to be the one getting six-figure offers to fight Anthony Yard and that sort of thing. So, you know, I guess you need to take risks to get reward. But it really does feel to me like he's being thrown to the wolves here on, on such short notice and in a different weight class. And, uh, you know, especially the fact that he was particularly unconvincing, apparently even at southern area level, the weight class below. So interesting to see how that one plays out. Um, but this this pay-per-view card, for me, uh, there is it has lost some of its luster. And I'm not saying these late-notice fights are bad fights, you know. Takam is a, a very good opponent to be bought in at late notice. Hellenius is a very good opponent um, to be bought in at late notice. You know, I'm, I'm really not disputing that. Um, but the very fact they are late notice fights takes something of the luster away from me. You know, um, late notice fights do not, in my opinion, make the best fights. Um, and it means other factors are considered, like, you know, have they had enough time to train? Um... You know, and it, it just means fighters can even approach the fights with different tactics. Maybe Dillian White knows Rob Elenius is going to fade, so he's just going to take it easy the first three rounds uh, and then come on in the second half of the fight. It may even mean that, you know, a fighter approaches a fight and it, the fight breaks down in a different manner. So, you know, let's see. But for me, I know it's an element of bad luck with all these injuries to Pulev and, you know, Callum Johnson, presumably, and the Lenroy Thomas bizarre situation, etc. But, you know, definitely does take something away from me. And this must be the latest notice pay-per-view in terms of opponents in, uh, certainly since I've been covering boxing on this channel. Um, I will say that. Um, let, let's, let's switch up topics massively. Let's talk the World Boxing Super Series. Uh, really, really digging this tournament. You know, really, really impressed by what I'm seeing so far in this tournament to date. Um... Murat Gassiev. I haven't seen a lot of Gassiev. I've obviously heard the name. I've seen a few bits of him. It was obviously the, the well-known Lebedev fight last year. I really liked the way um, um, Gassiev took care of Bladarchik the other day. I've watched that fight in full now. Um, it's a third round KO, so it won't take you too long to check it out. Um, Gassiev was expected to win the fight. I believe Bladarchik was the tournament outsider, but he was a uh, a, a, a veteran who'd shown signs of great durability in his career and he was absolutely wiped out by Gassiev. Uh, I'm sure I cannot be the first person to make this comparison. For me, Gassiev fights like a cruiserweight Gennady Golovkin. He may be slightly cruder than Gennady Golovkin. Um, you know, he's quite easy to hit, quite easy to catch, I believe. Um, but he, he fights like a stalker. You know, he kind of comes forward, he brings that immense pressure, uh, he marches on, he uses the jab, but he kind of uses his jab as a way of pushing his opponent back and positioning them. And then he looks to get inside the pocket. And he, he kind of takes that Gennady Golovkin approach from my money of looking to cut down the ring, sinking punches to the body. He looks to be a very, very hard body puncher from what I've seen. Um, but he's a, a real threat. And from memory, I don't have his box look in front of me. From memory, I think he's really young. I think he's like 24, 25. So this guy's got a real future ahead of him. Uh, I'm not sure he'll make into the best heavyweight. I know they've got ambitions to do that. Um, you know, I, I think the move from cruiserweight to heavyweight is a very, very substantial move. And I think someone with Gassiev style would find himself on the end of a lot of very long, very powerful jabs up with the big boys. But, you know, Gassiev is a, a real threat in this tournament and you know what we're, we're halfway through the cruiserweight tournament now and um you know all of their winners have performed excellently 
Um, actually, Bradis hasn't performed excellently. Bradis put in a, an average performance, but the other three winners performed excellently. And uh, there's been no surprises in this tournament whatsoever just yet. It's been all the favourites who win. So, you up next, we've got Unier Dortkos versus Murat Gassiev. Wow, that's a good fight. Um, that is a good fight. Both guys who I haven't seen too much of, but both guys I've been totally impressed by in their preliminary fights in this tournament. Both guys who seem to carry a lot of power and both guys with some real potential. Um, that's a fight you wouldn't bet on going the distance, let's put it that way. Um, from the brief bits I've seen of the two, Gassiev would be my inclination, but you know, we'll have to see more. Who knows how good Dortikos is, who knows just how heavy his hands are. But I, I like what I saw in Gassiev the other day. Usyk versus Bredes. Uh, Usyk, understandably, a big favourite in that fight. I believe he's 1-5 to five on. Um, Bredes didn't overly impress against Mike Perez. And you kind of get the impression there's more dimensions to Usyk's game. Um, for what it's worth, um, the bookmakers, best prices available. Usyk, 8-15. to 15. Gassiev, 9-2. to two. Bredes, 11-2. to two. Door to cost eight to one, so uh, a bit of support for Gassiev. Um, Bradis slightly weakening in the market after his um, uh, performance against um, uh, Perez. Door to cost at eight to one. Yeah, I mean you could make a tangible argument. That's a bit of value, but he's somewhat of an unknown commodity still. Um, even after the way the uh, the tournament has uh, progressed so far, obviously he won his fight by a. A fairly devastating stoppage um, but I guess the question of him will be about how he performs uh, over multiple multiple rounds against class of this level um, but it's a really really good tournament and Murat Gassiev uh, definitely had me impressed the other day uh, if you haven't seen it recommend checking out his fight against Vladarchik and you know, I know that opponent doesn't represent the elite of the cruiserweight at this stage of his career but I like what I saw in him definitely as for the super middleweights we had um uh, some big changes in the outright winning market there. Uh, Eubank, 6-4 to four on favourite. Big, big change there. Callum Smith, 9-4. to four. George Groves, 5-2. to two. Jürgen Bremer and Rob Brandt, 50-1. to one. You know, I, I can't help thinking that from a pure gambling perspective, it's worth having a pound or two on either Jürgen Bremer or Rob Brandt, whoever you think wins that fight. I'm half tempted to have a pick at Jürgen Bremer because... I think Jürgen Bremer could beat Rob Brom. And I also think on his best day, Jürgen Bremer could possibly beat Callum Smith. I don't see Callum Smith having you know, anything that will have Bremer going into the ring scared. I appreciate Smith is the bigger punter, maybe the younger guy, um, the guy with the more momentum and the brighter future. Bremer's very much in the autumn of his career. But Bremer can still cause a lot of problems for people. And uh, you know he's very experienced, very wily, knows what he's doing in there, real technician. He's a hard guy to beat. I just think, I'm not saying either of those guys are going to win this tournament, but if you're someone who thinks that one of them is definitely going to beat the other, if you're someone who favours Brandt over Bremer, I, I do see Callum Smith as beatable. You know, I think he almost lost to Scoglin. So if we believe that Bremer's a level above Scoglin, which I think he still might be, um, you're potentially getting... 50 to 1 odds on someone who you could tangibly make a case will make it through to the final. Now, I'm not saying that Jurgen Bremer beats a George Groves or a Chris Eubank Jr. in the final, but what I am saying is you're getting 50 to 1 now. Uh, if he does make it through to the final, you won't be getting more than 5 to 1. Uh, and, you know, you can then manipulate and play the market so you can make a profit each side. Um, but interesting that the public perspective on this tournament is that Chris Eubank Jr.'s performances and the way he took care of Avni Yildirim now puts him very, very much at the top of the market. Um, you know, Eubank uh, has always been like a sort of second favourite. Callum Smith has always been a, um, a favourite for the tournament on the basis that I guess he had the easier side of the draw. Uh, well, right now, um, you know, that's been completely reversed. And Callum Smith's obviously shown enough fragility in that fight on Scotland to make the betting public want to take him on. And we're seeing Eubank... As a uh, as a real big favourite, frankly, Callum Smith at nine to four, I still see as a bad price. Um, in fact, I'd be so confident that if you're one of these people who is thinking of betting George Groves to beat Chris Eubank Jr. or thinking of betting Chris Eubank Jr. to beat George Groves, I'd almost advise you to consider having a look at the odds and thinking if you think Eubank beats Groves, why don't you just bet on Eubank to win the tournament outright? 
I mean, there is some obvious risk there if Eubank, for example, were to withdraw from the tournament, which has been speculated. But if he beats George Groves, it's less likely he'll withdraw from the tournament. Clearly, there's the risk of injury in that fight. Um, but obviously, the big pot of gold, the huge money in the Super Series we've heard all about is available to the winner. So if he gets through the semi-finals, he is likely going to want to fight in the final. And, um, you know, it's hard to see Eubank beating George Groves and then losing to Callum Smith. So I think that if you're, you're one of these people like me who thinks Eubank could well beat Groves, 6-4 on him winning the tournament potentially represents good value. You know, I, I, I think Callum Smith is still a very, very poor price in the enhanced odds of 9-4. He was 6-4 a few weeks back. But yeah, this World Boxing Super Series is really hotting up and really, really enjoying it. hope we see another bout of it next year. I hope the tournament is financially viable and the backers can give it another go because it's creating some great fights and you know bringing some real lifeblood to some divisions that needed it um so really really enjoying watching that uh, i'm gonna say that uh let's nip back let's change subjects again completely let's talk about some of the fights from last weekend because i've caught up a bit more um video is already up on the channel with my thoughts on the joe joyce and michael venom page fights i was able to check them out yesterday um so if you're interested in hearing my thoughts on them um please check out the video that's already up on the channel went up yesterday uh, i still haven't fully completely caught up with the action um i haven't for example watched josh warrington or ryan burnett um neither of those guys are fighters who i've overly warmed to in the past i guess uh, you know call me a casual fan i haven't necessarily warmed to their personalities i haven't necessarily warmed to their styles and I just haven't really overly enjoyed the fights that they've been in, um, being completely frank. Uh, so I've actually watched some of the guys in the, the smaller fights this weekend, if you like, purely from a, an entertainment perspective that I've kind of enjoyed watching them. So let me just say a few words about a few of the guys I've seen this weekend. I'm just going to refer to a little notepad here because I made a, a few notes on the guys I have had the opportunity to see. Uh, let me start by talking about Leon Woodstock who's someone I've mentioned a few times on this channel. Uh, he fought... Um, God, I'm going to get the guy's name wrong now. Was it uh, Poxton? Yeah, he fought Poxton, who was in a fight of the year contender last year with Boy Jones Jr. Uh, tough fight for Woodstock. You know, he didn't look... Uh, the finished article in there, he ended up getting involved in a real scrap. Very much giving up his height rates, you know, not using his fundamentals, and uh, maybe that's just who he is as a fighter. Um, but... You know, the way he was looking against Poxton, the way he was getting clipped. I actually listened to Arthur Tech Sports' video on this, and he said something similar. Um, but he, the way he's looking currently, he can kind of get to a, similar, a certain level in the sport, be that English title, be that British title. But you just kind of wonder if he keeps getting involved in fights like that, and if he keeps getting clipped, um, that the ceiling may be a bit lower for him than we'd initially hoped for. Uh, he's still very young. And if I were Frank Warren, I'd almost look to slow him down now. You know, he's clearly a guy who's got the potential to be marketable. He's clearly the guy who's got the potential to be involved in very exciting fights going forward. Um, but as he's starting to step up in levels, we're seeing him caught more defensively. We're seeing him sucked into things he doesn't need to be sucked into. And, you know, perhaps more time in the gym, more time working on his fundamentals. Maybe a switch up with his training team, I don't know. Working on things like the construction of his jab discipline in there perhaps that could see him become a much much better fighter he fights very much like a Eubank Jr very explosive very dynamic puts punches in bunches with bad intentions I like what I see but I think some of the gaps in his game will stop him getting to the levels he could do unless they're addressed um, I checked out Zelfa Barrett saw a few rounds of him fight um, he's a good fighter he looks very very fundamentally sound He's in another weight, he's in the same weight class as Woodstock. So there's some good fighters in there. Obviously, you've got Poxton, Boy Jones Jr. You've got guys towards the top of the division like Stephen Smith, Liam Walsh, uh, Martin Ward, Maxi Hughes. You know, there's some names in that super featherweight division. And, you know, maybe they can start squaring off against each other. Maybe Mitchell Smith to come back at that division. I don't know. Um, you'd like to think there's some real, real good domestic names. But Zelfa Barrett is one who needs to be in this mix. Um, very fundamentally sound, um, you know, for me, uh, looks heavy handed, looks very crisp, looks a very sharp guy. Uh, he possibly has had less of a push than Leon Woodstock so far, because Woodstock is the guy whose style is going to appeal to the more casual fan, and Woodstock's probably the more instantaneously marketable out of the two. Um, but Zelfa Barrett, for me, is another one worth keeping an eye on. You know, he may even have a higher upside. His 
career has been slightly more under the radar, slightly quieter today. There'll be people watching this video who uh, haven't even heard of him, let alone seeing him. But he's someone you look at him when you're assessing future champions and you're thinking, yeah, this guy could do something in the sport. So I'd recommend checking him out. Um, as I say, I haven't seen Ryan Burnett's fight. Heard a lot about um, the scorecards. So I'm sure we'll hear more about that on the podcast and the panel tomorrow. But I'll have to check that out. Haven't seen Warrington's fight uh, against Dennis Salan. Uh, understand Warrington performed with some credit. Warrington, for me, he's a hard fighter to get interested in. He's kind of one of these guys who we know he's a very, very, very good fighter. But the question is, can he make that step up to the elite level? You know, against the Selbys, against the Framptons. My strong belief is that he'll come up short at that level. And I think that's the consensus among boxing fans. But... We kind of need him tested there to find out. And, you know, you wonder if he's such a big ticket seller and he's got his own thing going on financially with that side of things, surely that, you know, maybe there is some benefit to just keeping him at this level and getting him selling out arenas. But the time will come where he'll have to fight a Selby or a Frampton or, you know, a Gary Russell Jr. or something of that nature. And um, for me, a lot of the same questions will remain about him. I did watch Tyrone Nurse versus Jack Catterall. Tyrone Nurse is one of these fighters, he's kind of like a James DeGale, where he's one of these fighters who, he's got a flaw in his game that you'd think he'd be able to iron out, but he just doesn't seem to be able to iron it out. You know, he constantly gets sucked into fights that he doesn't need to, constantly gets backed up to the ropes, constantly gets sucked into trade-offs and fighting in the pocket and scrapping with guys, gives up all of his technical advantages, gives up his height, gives up his reins, gets sucked into places he doesn't need to be. And it constantly backfires. He constantly ends up getting in tougher fights than he need to. And he was punished against it badly uh, by dropping a loss to Jack Catterall. Uh, disappointing from Nurse. Catterall looked fine. He looked fair without looking spectacular. Having seen that fight, you wouldn't say either of them are necessarily the same prospect of a Josh Taylor and taking it a step further, you actually wouldn't necessarily believe either are the same level of a prospect as a or a Davis. You know, they both for me looked it was an unattractive fight, the styles didn't gel, but neither of them you were left with the impression that these guys are gonna be superstars. Can Tyrone Nurse come again? I don't know. He's shown an unwillingness to adapt his game and he continues to make the same mistakes. Um I don't think he can come again unless he addresses them. And I'm starting to think if he was going to address them, he would have addressed them by now. I also think he looks very big at 140 and wonder if it would be to his benefit to move up to 147. Although having said that, his lack of power is obvious at 140. At 147, that problem would only be exacerbated. As for Jack Catterall, it's a live domestic division. Lots of names in that division. <coughs> Let's hope he can get in some of the big fights. I've seen him kind of blown hot and cold. I've seen him in fights where he's looked very good. I've seen him in fights where he's looked a bit plodding, um, yeah, a bit average. And I've kind of still reserving judgment on Catterall. Uh, he's someone I haven't really come to a final conclusion on. Fair play to him. Very good win over Tyrone Nurse. He's clearly a very good fighter. Quite how high his ceiling is, uh, I, I haven't really got a strong opinion on that just yet. Um, Josh Kelly, let's talk about him. Um, I heard Ultratech Sports mentioning him again. Shout out to Ultratech Sports. Um, Kelly, all the style in the world. Uh, you know, he's destroying this opposition. He's running in with his hands down, throwing ridiculous head movement, throwing punches from strange angles, leading with power shots, you know, running through opposition. He, he's clearly a very skilled, very talented guy with immense reactions. He almost tries to fight a bit like a Roy Jones Jr. I guess that's the best way of describing him. Um, you know, as Ultratech Sports correctly pointed out, the water at 147 is very deep. And before we start calling him a world champion, we seriously have to start asking how's he going to do against a Crawford, a Spence, a Furman. And, you know, I think when you fight those guys, being all style is not enough. You need to have some substance. So um, let's see, as Kelly steps through the level, as he gets more towards like the sort of um, domestic title, European title level, uh, it's not going to be possible, because it never is, to just win fights by throwing crazy punches from reins and throwing, you know, leading with hooks from the other side of the ring and that sort of thing. We'll have to see a bit more from him. He's clearly a, a very, very, very big talent uh, and, you know, fascinating to see how he progresses and extremely entertaining to watch. Um, 
of the matchroom lot for me. Um, Josh Kelly is, is near the top, to be honest, in terms of which prospects I think are most likely to go on to world title odds. But as with all these things, you never, ever, ever know until um, the right level of opposition is there. And how do we know what his punch resistance like? How do we know what his stamina is like? You know, these are all open questions until they get answered. Anyway, guys, I've rambled on enough tonight. We've talked about some of last week's fight. We've talked about the World Boxing Super Series. We've done a little bit of betting. We've talked about that pay-per-view card, which has got probably the most cancelled fights in pay-per-view card history. Um, but there you go. Wanted to put down some thoughts. Uh, we'll be back for the podcast tomorrow, which will cover all of these topics again with the panel and in more detail. And then maybe Thursday onwards, we'll start to look ahead more to the big fight at the weekend and some of the other action. Uh, let me know your thoughts on any of the content covered in this video in the comments section below. Do drop a comment. Let us know your perspective on the fights. Um, if you've enjoyed the video, please hit the thumbs up. If you're new, subscribe. If you haven't done so before, please subscribe. Um, and yeah, if you want to support the channel, you can also give me a follow on Twitter, at Boxing Gossip. Uh, you can add me as a friend on Facebook using the link in the description box below. And as always, guys, just want to say really appreciate you taking the time to tune in to what we're doing here. Thanks for watching.